the Mrs. Gwyneth and company. And through the pain and the unwashed muddy trousers which Nephis wore, he was settled to his knees by an unearthly feeling, a sentiment too deep and too dark to express merely in words, though he tried to himself there in the depths of the roots of the tree there in front of him, of which surrounded he and his being so tightly that he was sure that they would swallow him completely and do the earth with them, only to be settled down there in that great earthly tomb that he should find something of sorrow and depth therein where on this earth he could not. Nephis understood that it was of consequence and wrought in an iron pain that he must do what he was to do, that he would commit himself to such an act, that he would that he must kill the woman, his wife, the Mrs. Gwyneth. Of course, discreetly it would have to be committed to and fulfilled, and he could not be caught. No, he could not survive it, not that, in this moment, he had in, if he had any concern for himself. And no, actually, sadly, he did have concern for himself, despite his pain, and all he could think to do was to kneel there in the mud, staring out into the distance at the, at the clouds, which seemed to nearly touch the ground at the top of the crest. They were nebulous, they were cumulus clouds. He knelt there on top of the, that high place, staring at the cumulus clouds, gray as a feather might be, plucked from the wing of a great beast, perhaps, stowed away beneath the pillow of a beautiful woman, a beautiful wife, who... Nephis could think no more of his melancholic and yet beautiful wife, if one could call such a woman such a title. Nephis wiped his eyes and again stood, leaning against the willow tree there, which stood on that high place at the top of the crest, awaiting him, knees muddied, trousers torn. Undoubtedly it was something that his wife would take notice of, the trousers, as she was a clever woman and his stains were obvious. How, would he, how he would kill her with, without her suspecting, he was unsure, but he would do it, surely. He thought to himself quietly, his back scratching against the dark and rough bark of the willow tree. Of course, as he d d descended the crest there in the window s window sill, he could see he, he could see her on the bed, the Mrs. Gwyneth. She had black hair, black as as his hair, and had green eyes, the color of the grass after a heavy rain, the color of which such was the grass now, as he tread upon it, her grass, as it had been her father's estate and his father's after hers, after his. With no son to inherit, she of any reasonable course did inherit the property to which the titles and lands did now belong to Nephis, though beneath the scrutiny and ever so cautious eye of the Mrs. Gwyneth. She was yet called that he that he pondered to himself, though she was his wife, or had been, something that he'd always lamented to himself in the quiet hours of the night, we as they were before he finally shut his gloomy eyes and placed himself to rest next to her, stiff as a corpse perhaps, and cold, cold as one too, as he lay bare, and as she lay in gleeful bliss wrapped in sheets, and insisted that he maintain himself proper therein to never touch her, let her lest her wrath become unleashed upon him. She was a spiteful woman, despite or perhaps because of her beauty. Nevis knew this, but he would continue on with his scheming nonetheless, and the deed would be complete, in one way or another. Somebody had told him once, he remembered vaguely, that only under such pressures of the heart did one ever accomplish anything of great worth within the, the earthly realm, and he was sure that now, in, that, in this moment, think, thinking it there to himself, he understood what that might mean, and what that might signify to his personhood. He wondered also, would she, would the Mrs. Gwyneth discover his motives, and perhaps she would? would what would she do then? Nephis thought he knew that, knew that answer as well. And he dare not think of it, and he dare not imagine what could occur. His tears dried, he waved to her, and though at first she did not notice, she did wave back to him, her usual smile full of fake, straight white teeth that somehow seemed to mock at him in his attempt to brush things off, so to speak. Of course, she would assume that he was out, of, out working, he thought to himself stupidly, and the muddy trousers would be of no consequence to him, except perhaps for a scolding, and he could not be working on his knees, no, not her husband, or that he could not be wearing those trousers while doing so. Unfortunately, this was simply something that she would express concern for out of a sheer feeling or perhaps pressure of obligation, duty, as his wife. Though she had des desecrated the marriage irreparably as far as Nephis would ever be concerned about it, as well, her pride would be wounded to know that her husband, the man who she was, in, who she was committed to, or perhaps not so committed to, 
had to work on his knees. He w he wondered steadfastly as well, would she? It did not matter. His predictions made him sick. Nephis predictions of his wife as he was not accustomed to such cunning thought. Life to him for the most part, except perhaps for the most crucial part, had been given to him by his forebearers. So used to this was he, the news of his wife's betrayal. Well, it could not be dealt with in any other way save one. When Nephis reached the front door of his house to the right of where he walked, away from the willow tree, he opened it reluctantly. As he did so, he thought again in reluctance, wondering if it were possible that his wife would... The doubts of what his wife would or would not do, would or would not say, what, what or which not, whatever. They filled his mind in the darkest corners of the room there and did make themselves apparent to him there in that moment as he stood awaiting his wife, who would surely... Dear, she called, to which Nephis knew that he must reply quickly, must quickly reply, as the Mrs. Gwyneth was not one for waiting. Yes, sweetheart, he called back, tentatively. Then, th then there was a pause, but the response came after but a moment. Could you come into, into the kitchen, she said, almost mockingly, he thought. He could hear it in her voice, he was sure of it, as if he didn't know what she... It, it did not matter. He would abide by her wishes. Yes, dear, he called, almost jeeringly. He all but hated that about himself, his cheerful, almost passive demeanor. The very demeanor that perhaps had led him into such an outlandish, dismal position. He supposed that it could it could be far worse, as he would be as he could be poor and with but the same problem. Perhaps it was better, he thought, that he have the wealth to afford such luxuries as he had, even if for the actions of his poor wife. He could not enjoy them, and she was poor, as he knew what he would do. As he arrived in the kitchen. He noted that his wife held a knife, and she was smiling as she did, cutting up a few onions and carrots to add to a stew she had boiling on the stove, a wood stove that sat in the center of the kitchen. Admittedly, with his murderous thoughts close in mind, he could not help but to think of himself a sudden yet irrational thought, and the thought was this, of course my wife, she knows that I will try to kill her. It was a humorous thought, really, that his wife might know of his intentions, yet as she chopped the onions and the carrots, he thought surely to himself that she must know. He could barely help himself from nervous laughter. He could barely hide his intent until, finally, he managed it. He wanted to do it there, in the kitchen, with, it, with her knife to get it over with, so that he wouldn't have to think about it any further. But he did not, as he knew that he could not. The repercussions, of course, would be too hefty a cost for him to sustain, and he himself would die bloodied in a cell somewhere or worse. The thought of it managed to straighten his back and curve his nervousness. Quickly he regained, regained his composure, what little he had left of it to begin with, or at least managed to return to his normal state. And although not so even a state as it were, he fooled the Mrs. Gwyneth for a time, for now. She set, she set down the knife, further calming Neva's nerves, however, however unintentional, and gently brushed the carrots and the onions and the rest into the stew. It was easy enough for Nephus to stand there simply and watch her, though he waited anticipatorily as he knew that she would soon ask him to do something for her, to fetch something, to help her with this task or that task, it did not matter. Whatever it would be, Nephus' thoughts were elsewhere, obviously, and he wished more than anything that he was not in that place in that moment. But there he stood, frozen as though he had been caught in a blizzard just moments before, as if he had been raging just out, as, his, as if... The blizzard had been raging just outside the door, as if he had sat in a cool bath for much too long. He wandered there in his mind, thinking and wondering of the excuse he might use to escape whichever task she would set before him, but he could think of none in that moment, and there suddenly it seemed she asked her question. Why are your trousers muddied, she asked, rather pleasantly. Nephis nodded, somehow surprised by it, the question, but answered easily enough. Oh, I was working outside, in the garden, he said to cover himself. And those trousers, she asked, smiling, and then look, looking down into the boiling stew, her voice dropping ever so slightly. That's, that's, that's odd, sweetheart. You don't normally do that, do you? No, Nephis said, of course not. Are you okay, she asked, looking straight at him. As if she, as if she cared, Nephis thought to himself. Of course, he said, of course I'm okay, he shrugged. Okay, she said sweetly. Well, next time, use your work trousers, sweetheart. It would have been difficult for Nephis to hate her for, for the fact of of which he was certain. She was such a sweet woman. She was a kind woman. 
it would make his deed that much more difficult. Of course, he said, regaining composure, I will of course do that next time, dear, you're right. Clean yourself up for dinner, she said, pointing out of the kitchen, and fetch me a, a towel, if you would. Nephis could only nod. Yes, dear, he said, I will be right back. She smiled and returned to what she was doing in the kitchen. As she did, Nephis returned to the living room just outside, made his way to a cupboard therein, and then returned to the kitchen with a fresh white towel. As white as his wife was pale, it seemed, or would be. He set it down on the counter and ex exited quietly as his wife returned to chopping. The thud of the knife over the louder, ever the louder against the cutting board, it seemed, as Nephis walked away and towards the washing room. Therein there was a large bowl of water, another towel just as white and clean, and with it he began to clean his face and hands. Soon he was down to his undergarments, and, after he had washed, quietly made his way to his room, their room, he and the Mrs. Gwyneths, and changed within those quarters. Quarters. Eventually, when he was ready for dinner, Nephis made his way down the stairs again, which creaked ever so slightly as he stepped on them, and towards the kitchen, wherein he encountered the Mrs. Gwyneth once more except this time accompanied by someone else, a man. Nephis looked the man up and down and analyzing him. He was tall and sturdy, strong by any measure of it, it seemed, with a strong jaw, clean shaven, and some sort of look of vague intention on his face, though Nephis couldn't exactly tell what it meant. His wife, the Mrs. Gwyneth, was speaking to him, smiling calmly. Nephis, unaware of, what the, who, of who the man was, looked at the Mrs. Gwyneth, who looked back to him as he entered and kindly introduced, introduced him. His name was Erickson, George Erickson. Nephis remembered shaking the man's hand before he left as apparently he was there on some sort of business which the Mrs. Mrs. Gwyneth promised to inform him of later on that night. As the man left, he knew that by comparison, he was at least by any physical measurement, and if the man's attitude and composure had been in any measure of it as well, at a disadvantage to him, to say the least. Why he thought of him as competitive when his wife... The Mrs. Gwyneth was, after all, his wife. Well, he wished he could wonder, but he could not. It was fairly obvious who it had been with, what she had done, and, of course, Nephis knew. He must kill, too.